Yo, what's up? I finally managed to experience playing all nations on all BRs after the merge. And in the process of doing so, I played against all types of players you can imagine. Be it beginners on low BR, also veterans on low BR, but especially ranging to sweat lords and sweaty stacks and even cheater sweat lord stacks on high BR. So I've gained an overview over all types of behavior you can experience in the game. And I noticed that basically all players playing this game repeat multiple of the following five core mistakes. Now I'm going to show you these mistakes and going to explain how to avoid them. Doing so will make you a much much better player. Absolutely, instantly one of the best players in the game. Because avoiding these five mistakes will turn everyone into a great player. So let's start. Critical mistake number one is not understanding map control. Now map control means that your team has control over as much of the map as possible. Now obviously, theoretically both teams start with 50-50% map control. The defenders have their side, the attackers have their side and it's quite even. Now every single decision you make gives you more control over either the parts of the map that you already have strong influence over or even gives you control over new parts of the map. This is, by the way, the same concept as in chess. In chess, you want to control as much of the map as possible. And if you don't know how to play chess at all, what you can do is basically always do the moves that give you as much control over the map, meaning more, you control more fields with your move, with your next move, and a move that gives you as much freedom as possible to do more moves. The same thing you want to do in Enlisted, also in General Warfare. You don't want the enemy to control any parts of the map, because every single, every single point of the map the enemy controls, he can use to his advantage. If the enemy has a good elevated position, he can build some anti-tank gun there and start shelling you and you have a problem. If the enemy cuts you off from, from parts of the map, especially parts of where you could spawn, the enemy forces you to spawn in certain areas and now he can build an HMG or park a tank and start spawn killing you, which is a very disgusting feeling if you're on the receiving side and a very boring feeling for the attacker side. So it's, it's just a bad game for both sides. And people constantly complain and bitch about that in the forums and social media, but no one of them even mentions how that came to be because, once again, almost every single map in the game is even in the beginning of the game. So Whenever, there, there come, whenever a situation arises where the map control becomes uneven, it's due to the fault of the players. The reason why map control is so important is that if you lack map control, if there's a strong imbalance between how much your enemies control and how little your team controls, it opens up situations that are basically unsolvable. Because a grey zone tank is very problematic, yes, but a grey zone tank is only dangerous when he can actually shoot into sensitive areas for your team and where he can also be safe in his position. Now this creates two up this this creates two possibilities to solve the issue. First of all, you want to avoid the area he is shelling and you also want to avoid the enemy to have points where he can just park a tank and be completely safe. Now this is also obviously a problem of game balance because there are some tanks that are very hard to kill. But once again, I've played straight after the merge. I had to level Soviets where I had lots of boosters and I played Soviets be a tree. Yes, worst mistake of my life. And I constantly got leveled up against be a five Germans. And I've seen more King Tigers than I've seen other types of tanks in these matches. And I had a pure BR3 army. Now guess what? I still destroyed every single King Tiger I've seen with a BR2 plane. Because no matter what they did, either they were either we either we had map control, and I could get close enough to him or flank him and blow him up with some anti-tank weaponry, or worst case scenario, he was a good player and he was hiding in a perfect spot, and our team fucked up too hard, and we were completely open to his shelling, well, then I just took a plane and bombed him. So, there's, for everything there's a solution, but the big takeaway here is, map control is the most important thing. If you have 
a critical lack of map control, the enemy can start oppressing you. And, and from that point on, it's an uphill struggle. Because no matter what you do, the enemy always has the upper hand. And no matter what you do, it will be less effective until you gain more map control. So how do you get map control? First, as a defender, do not get stuck to your objective that you're defending and to your spawn area and gray zone. Always push forward. The more you push forward, the more con map you control outside of your objective. And the less area your enemy has to establish himself and to set up positions that are going to be beneficial for his attack. So... The more you push forward, the you the larger the distance is going to be for the ready points that they are building. And the more they have to run. And this alone makes winning as an attacker basically impossible <laughs> if your ready point distance is too large. Also, you want to spread out not only to the front, but also laterally, so the enemies can't flank you. This also makes sure that the enemy can't park a tank in your spawn area, so close to your own gray zone. And just shell your objective from the side. Which would otherwise be completely devastating. So always push forward as a defender. If you keep the fighting away from the objective. You already have perfect map control. And it becomes almost impossible to win. Now if you're an attacker. You want to not only push forward to the point. But also once again behind the point. And to the sides. Because... Defenders inevitably need rally points to whenever you shell them because many points for defenders are very problematic to defend if an attacker tank is just shelling the point with high explosives and constantly clears it out. Also, open points are very hard to defend. It can be artillery striked and bombed non-stop. The only way to defend them is to have lots of ready points so you can, no matter how many defenders die, always throw new cannon fodder onto the point or you just as an offender, keep the fighting outside of the point. Otherwise, it's impossible to defend such points. As an attacker, you want to avoid exactly these two, these two essential ways of defending such points and make sure you A, push behind the, push behind the objective and sweep all of the enemy's rally points and APCs and B, make sure the enemy doesn't counterattack you. Now, there's a very common scenario where either defenders or attackers quickly bum rush the point, the first objective right after starting of the game. If this happens, it has first of all an extremely strong psychological effect, because I've, I've noticed in order to have fun in games and to avoid having very one-sided wins, I usually half as games until the enemies start to become very close to winning and then I start playing properly. But I noticed something, well, this often, well not often times, but often enough, leads to situations where the game in the beginning is easy, but in the last five minutes it gets sweaty. I recommend you to do the opposite. Do the Try to be as strong and overwhelmingly oppressive in the first minutes of the game. Because a first strong attack demoralizes most players so hard. Most of them are gonna quit. Now, not most of them, but many. And they're going to be psychologically in a defensive mode for the rest of the game. And if someone's in a defensive mode, he won't be creative anymore. He's going to work on primal instincts, meaning he, there won't be any sophisticated strategy or any flanking or counterattacking or any nuanced playing. No, he will be basically a monkey that's throwing stones and that's all. Yeah, <laughs> so that's what you want to do. You want to have a strong first attack. Now, if you're an attacker, a very strong bum rush in the beginning can capture points. It also makes more sense to not build rallies in the beginning for the first objective if the objective allows a quick bum rush. But what you want to make sure about that is you want to call an artillery strike first and wait for the artillery strike to clear out everything so you don't lose any, so you don't use lives without any sense that could be, could be saved while just waiting to, <laughs> for the shelling to stop. So this is the attacker's version. Also gives perfect map control. In order to increase the map control, you can attack not completely straight from the front, but from the sides. Many times you spawn either in the center or on the flanks. And if you're spawning on the center, obviously you want to run straight ahead. Because any diagonal lines mean you're running longer. And you lose you lose tempo this way.
But if you're spawning on his flanks, you perfectly want to use this advantage and attack from the flanks. Now, if you're a defender, you can do the same tactic. You want to instantly bum rush into the attackers. Because this keeps the fight away from the point, giving you more map control. Also, it saves you from the shelling that the objective is going to receive from artillery strikes and so on. And it completely demoralizes attackers because most attackers aren't prepared for, a, well, to be attacked in the first seconds of the game. And many objectives that, that close the line of sight and make it impossible to see in a, a, a defender team counterattacking, well, in these situations, counterattacks are completely effective because many people are just gonna be, well, they're gonna be talking, they're gonna be eating because they don't expect any enemy contact in the first seconds and then you're just gonna catch them completely off guard. So these types of attacks, strong attacks in the beginning, absolutely devastating, not only in their strategic value, but also in their psychological value. An enemy team that receives something like that, especially attackers which don't expect it at all, they will be shocked, literally, and their playstyle is gonna change. And after having done that, well, after some strong fir uh, three first minutes, you can literally just start having a nice comfy game without much sweat because you will feel like the enemies are gonna be much weaker. Also, it's, once again, much easier to keep control over the map if you put your enemies into a defensive frame. Because if the enemies are in a defensive frame, they won't think, especially subconsciously, about expanding their control over the map. No, they will try to think about how to not lose the area that they have. But this state of mind means that, well, <laughs> you don't capture any new map areas and every time you lose something you think about, oh no, how avoid we losing more because, well, okay, now, you, now you're already in a very imbalanced position and it gets worse and worse. So yeah, map control, absolutely important and absolutely crucial as a concept if you want to be a good player. Point two is much easier and shorter than point one because it's marking. Now marking, as everyone knows, isn't that hard to do. You literally click either the V button or, as I recommended in multiple videos, put marking on the shooting button. So left mouse from, I guess, everyone. Whenever you shoot, for almost all weapon types you're gonna use, you will automatically put a marker. Now this means you're marking thousands of times during a game, which is giving your team constant information. So whenever you're shooting somewhere, there are going to be lots of marks on the map, and not only your teammates, but also your bots are going to react to the marks. Especially during a fight, especially on high BR, where people have constant full auto spam, you don't have any time to click V. Yeah? Especially even if you know where the button is, even if you can find it with closed eyes, if your brain is under stress, the precision and performance of your brain drops. And even if you have to think for 10 deciseconds about where to click, you won't do it. Or if you try to do it, you'll be slowed down so hard you're gonna die in the game. So it has to be subconscious and automatic and that's why binding marking with the shooting button is absolutely crucial. I wouldn't want to play the game any other way. It has basically 1 million upsides. And it has the only downside of you sometimes mark without making sense. Well, oh, how bad. <laughs> yeah, it's literally, yes, you, you're winning $1 million and you pay $50. Yes, yes. <laughs> so, yeah, okay, makes sense, right? But this, is, this isn't even the problem. The actual problem is most people don't understand that you have to mark vehicles. And this is one of the most serious aspects of the game after the merge. Before the merge, I wouldn't even have put it into a video as a single point because it would be just, yeah, one side thing. But now, if you play high BR, you literally lose all the games where enemy tanks are not marked. And this is what people don't get. Tanks have to be marked all of the time. All of the time means all of the time. If they... First of all, many people don't know, I guess, that you have to double mark something. So if you mark something once, it becomes dark, it becomes like red or dark orange. If you mark it twice, it becomes dark red. And dark red means it's gonna stay marked for longer. This is an addition to the game since like six months or so. So always double mark, yeah? Very important, very important. 
And the second thing is, you always want to make sure that the, the tanks are marked because the easiest way to blow up high power tanks that are almost impossible to kill, like King Tigers, is or Jumbos, is to bomb them. But bombing oftentimes is very complicated if you don't know where the tank is. And many people have the misconception that, oh, I don't need to mark because the enemy can think, uh, our teammate can think where the tank is. Yeah, motherfucker, how? <laughs> In theory, this is the problem. Many people haven't experienced any real combat or, or something like that, I guess, because things that work in theory don't work in real life most often. And this is the difference between people who actually can perform well on a high level and people who fail and who can only perform in theoretical terms. Because there are so many things that can go wrong while you're in a plane that won't, that won't go wrong if a tank is marked. For example, the tank moves. Oh, if he's marked, the game's gonna show me where the tank is, even if he's hiding. If he's not marked, that doesn't work. Yeah? Or the tank gets smoked. I've recently seen some very smart King Tiger players who smoke themselves on purpose. And then, yes, guess what? It's gonna be a problem. But <laughs> And try to find smoke on the grey Berlin streets. Yes, it looks exactly like the city itself. But if it's marked, you know, oh, there was a mark there and now everything's grey. Yeah, I can I can deduce where the tank must be. Also, if you're in, in city maps and high BR mostly is Berlin and Stalingrad, if you're in a city, or even Normandy, where you also have 50% city maps and buildings, if you're in a city map, it is crucial to get the right angle to approach a target. Because if a tank is hiding behind a building, there's all, most of the time only one way or two ways parallel to the street to bomb it. Otherwise, your bombs will miss. So you have to very often know where the tank is 10 to 20 seconds before you approach it. The, the faster and the less maneuverable your plane is, the earlier you have to get into the right alignment. And if your tank isn't aligned 20 seconds before you reach the objective, oftentimes you cannot bomb it. Once again, another thing people don't understand apparently. So, and this only works if, you, if, you, if the tank is marked. So you as a pilot can always know where it is. And another thing is, let's say everything goes right and you're approaching it. And then you suddenly get shot. Or you see an enemy plane and you think, alright, it's important to shoot down this plane now and deal with the tank later. Once again, if you're in a dogfight and you have your hands literally full with clicking and you absolutely have to focus and think where the plane is and so on, if you also have to think about where this damn tank is and if you even have to write to type your monkey teammates to mark the tank and keep it marked, yes, guess what? Things are gonna not work out. <laughs> But, once again, everything is easy and comfy if the tank is constantly marked. So, yeah, once again, tanks absolutely need to be marked, always. Same thing goes for anti-tank guns. I've also noticed some very smart players on high BR dominating games with anti-tank guns. And there are surprisingly some very insane places in Stalingrad where people build anti-tank guns on houses and just get 50 kills in 2 minutes. <laughs> yes, I've been on the receiving end of that. And I literally didn't see this damn anti-tank gun un until someone randomly marked it, I guess, because it took forever to find it. Yeah, so absolutely crucial. And the last thing for that, it's important if, if someone wants to be a really good player to not only mark a tank after it killed your tank and 20 of your teammates, but be expecting and think about where enemy tanks might come from and whenever you have second time just look in the direction and randomly click the mark button and see if you find an enemy tank because especially on high BR it's absolutely important who gets the first shot if you're playing if you're playing tiger versus is as long as it's not a king tiger but even then the first tank who gets a good shot is gonna win and then you're gonna have a dominating spree for like one minute. And this can turn a game completely around. So being the first tanker to shoot or the first the first vehicle pilot to bob the enemy tank is absolutely important. So make sure that you are thinking about where enemy tanks might be throughout the game, even if you don't see anything, and try to randomly, randomly locate one 
Because this is how you turn around those close games that you lost due to missing out on like 10 seconds of capture time. Point 3 is adaption to the enemy playstyle or strategy. Now many games you can win easily if you're a good player or if you're stacked up or if you have strong gear or especially if you watch my perk guides and perk your soldiers up so hard that they yeah, become complete rumbos. This is one thing, but there will be still 10 to 5% of remaining games where it becomes, where it feels like no matter how good you are, you still lose. These games are still winnable. <laughs> and here's the secret. Many players lack adaptability when it comes to how the enemy plays. Because, let's say, this type of player who's used to winning plays against another team of players who are used to winning. Yeah, who's gonna win now? Well, obviously there are some factors like gear, quality and stuff like that, but strategy is the most important factor. Especially in, in strategic maps that are not open, that are mostly closed, because the, the, clo the more closed the map is, the more strategizing you can do. Because open map means artillery strikes, planes and tanks are gonna dominate, which is dependence on very high level gear, but close ranged maps much easier to win with skill. And here's the most important thing. People need to start thinking and adapting about whenever they lose, what is the enemy doing, why are we losing? Yeah, for example, the easiest example obviously is a gray zone tanking, a gray zone camping tank. Yes, I've made 1000 examples about that, but you can constantly click on, and you see that in my games, by the way, I constantly click tap to see the game score. I don't do it to watch my points, I do it to watch how many engineer points the enemies have. So I always know how many directions of attack can I expect and how much is the intensity of defense or offense that I can expect. Because if the enemies have lots of ready points or lots of engineer points and they keep ticking up, if you have a good memory you can just memorize how many engineer points every enemy has. And then, you, and then you just look from like every 50 seconds on it and you see, oh, this player ticked up, this player ticked up. And if the upticking rate is roughly similar, you know, ah, all right, similar, very similar increase in rally points among, multiple, among engineer points for multiple players very likely means these are rally points ticking. Because it's otherwise very unlikely that, the, that players are building stuff in the same speed. And then you know, all right, they have three rally points. Yes, if your team only has one or two, you know, damn, this is going to be very hard because the team with more rally points usually has a strong advantage. Now, since the introduction of APCs, this strategy, this intelligence gathering doesn't work as precisely anymore because you don't see the impact of APCs. But you still see, all right. <laughs> By the way, this... this this imprecision is only rarely a problem, by the way, because most teams still don't, like most teams still only have one or two active APCs. So if one team has one rally point, let's say you're the only rally point builder, and you see four enemy players with many engineer points, you can expect them to be very disciplined, good players. So you, the enemy team still has more rally points. Also, Building of rally points is quite well correlated with using APCs for the same purpose. And then you see, all right, if they have more rally points than we have, we can also assume and expect they also have more APCs. So yeah, it, us having one or two APCs and only one rally point doesn't, doesn't uh, equalize the things. So you want to check the situation. And if you see, all right, the enemies have more rally points and they're defenders, you know, all right, it won't work out because they can easily grind us down because no matter how fast we kill them, they will be always back on point. Now, if you're a defender, this is a good strategy. You want to grind enemies down. But if you're an attacker and you find yourself stuck for five minutes on an objective and you're losing lives for five minutes, but you don't get any progress, the first thought that needs to come to the mind of a player is this is going to be very likely a loss. Because the same situation was repeated for the last five minutes without any progress. And this is exactly what you need to see whenever you're in a... Well, playing def defense is quite easy, so I won't go into details for that. But for attackers, it can become problematic. 
So here's the, the most common scenario. You're an attacker and you're rushing the enemy point and the enemy manages to, to kill every single wave you're sending. And then you want to see, alright, in the last two minutes or in the last wave that I've sent, meaning every single spawn I did, did we accomplish much? Did we manage to capture, let's say, 20% of the point? If you do that, and if your next attack captures again roughly 20%, you know, all right, this strategy works because every time we attack, we are investing lives, so respawn tickets, but we are also capping. And then you know, all right, if, if your capping rate is roughly okay, if you don't lose too many lives while trying to capture an objective, this strategy will win you the game. But if you see, all right, we basically don't make any progress or the progress is so small, it's not worth it. <laughs> And many another mistake is people think that just pushing on objective until it were until it works out with very slow progress would work. Nope, this doesn't because you rather have one strong wave and kept your objective than have like five small waves and basically not kept your objective. Now this sounds obvious, but people don't literally follow this strategy and this concept. And the way to get a strong attacking wave is to, once you see, all right, the defenders are too strong, we can't overwhelm them, just don't attack anymore and take time to set up rallies. And when you see, all right, I have one rally, I have an APC, I told you my teammates to also build rallies and place APCs. When you have six or seven rallies APCs, you send one attack and once this wave of attackers dies, so many people are going to spawn you're going to send the next attack and this attack will be usually enough to overwhelm the defenders. So this adaption is extremely important. Worst case scenario is you cannot send set up rally points and APCs that easily. Well, then you can deduce, ah, if we can't do that, reason for that is we don't have enough map control. Oh, yes, <laughs> because we the enemies pushed us back too far. Also, very often, if you see, all right, we, the enemies, the defenders are grinding us down, we can't push through their defenses. If you already have a rally point and APC, tell your team to do that multiple times. Use big boy words because this is a war game. If people expect clean language that's for children, yeah, come on. This is not, they're not serious. And use the time while they are building to sweep the enemy rally points in the flanks and in the gray zone. Because oftentimes, just having more rallies and more spawn pressure for your side won't work. So you need to limit the enemy spawn pressure. Increasing your own spawn pressure and decreasing your enemy spawn pressure basically works always. The crucial point is to understand that you're in a crisis situation early enough. So don't lose 500 lives on one ticket and then thinking, oh, I guess this won't work. No, just observe how your enemies interact with your first attacker waves and see all right do we make any kind of progress yes or no if there's no progress you know you're in a stagnant problem and you need to change your strategy to overcome this stagnation mistake number four is similar to mistake number three and it's people not adapting the amount of spawn pressure meaning increasing their rally points now i already explained this in detail for number three as a particular example for strategic adaption to the enemy so we don't have to explain that much here. The big takeaway is keep always check whether your team has enough spawn pressure, meaning your team spawns fast enough. Fast enough depends on how many spawn sources you have, so how many ready points and APCs you have, but also on the distance to the important areas. So if your spawn sources are too far away, they suck. Because having a spawn point 100 meters away while the natural spawn is 120 meters away, it, it's barely any difference. So this ready point cannot be really counted into, <laughs> into the calculation, yes? Well, you, you're saving 17% less. Well, you're saving 17% timing, ti ti running time. Okay, congratulations. So, <laughs> but you want to save around 50%. So, so this is the important point. Rally points and APCs need to be around, preferably, 60 to 70 meter distance. If you can make it closer, sure, 
but usually 60 to 70 is the closest you can safely make and which is also a good area distance. 80 meters also fine, anything longer than 80 meters is already too bad unless there's literally no way to, to get closer. Most of the time if you're crossing a river, yes, building a rally instantly on the other side of the, ri on the, of the river. So you never have to cross the damn river again. That makes sense, even if you still have 100 meters to the go. But, but yeah, usually you want to have enough, enough proximity. For APCs, the minimum distance is 50. So I recommend to park at 52 meters away. Reason for that is oftentimes the APC can shake a little bit after you park it or roll a bit. So you want to just stop your engine while you're at 60 to 55 meters and then you slowly roll to 52 meters. Also, sometimes your APC is going to be hit by something and then you have a little bit of more di distance uh, to make sure your APC doesn't get pushed too close and becomes inactive. Yeah, so always when you see there's a problem, increase your spawn pressure. Also, correlated with that, you want to think ahead, if you're especially if you're an attacker, but also if you're a defender, where to place your next rallies. And the easiest example for that is again as an attacker. If you're about, if your team is about to capture and you see, all right, our team is capping quickly, just take an APC and already drive to the next point. If you don't know where it's going to be because there are possibly multiple points that can become active, yeah, then just drive in the general direction. This can give you a significant time advantage and enable you to cap a point without losing any lives. This is also very strong. And if you're in a stack, especially, it's beneficial. Because I constantly, I'm constantly playing control, so I see, alright, I'm making sure we have rally points, I'm making sure we have APCs, and otherwise I'm flying around to bomb enemy tanks. Because if I'm playing against, if I'm playing on high BR, A, it's too boring if I just destroy everyone on, on the ground with, with infantry, and B, if the enemy is destroying us, usually it's only because they have some overpowered vehicles, so I have to take care of them. And this gives me enough time to constantly see how it's going, to, to look at the map, to mark what's going on, to find enemy vehicles, and, and look at what, where the enemy planes are, look at where the enemies are spawning, maybe I see groups of enemies running, but also to see what's going on, and I constantly ask my teammates, are we going to cap or not? Because if they say, okay, we're going to cap very likely in the next 10-20 seconds, I know, all right. I just stop whatever I'm doing and I'm going to rush to the next point to build a fast new rally. And oftentimes you can even get close to the enemy gray zone and it stops and you're not allowed to get any farther. Otherwise, you're going to die in a couple of seconds. And you know, all right, I'm just going to wait here. I'm going to replenish my stamina so I can quickly run again. And I'm waiting until we cap. And once we cap, I'm going to instantly start charging forward. And this is going to give us 30 to 1 minute more. This is going to give us 30 to 1 minute time advantage. And 30 to 1 minute time advantage, once again, can change a whole game. Usually it does, because 1 minute fighting advantage, it's literally worth a couple hundred respawn tickets. And our last critical mistake that players do, not only in listed, but in all types of games, is to not use the time and big information advantage of a completed game and analyze the game after you played it. Because you don't have to do it all the time. It's more than enough to do it once every 50 games or every 20 games, depending on how often you win or lose. When I started playing the game, I lost almost always. I got completely booty clapped and I was playing Germans in Moscow when Germans were super weak. So yes, I got constantly destroyed and there was a lot of me to learn. <laughs> yes, And your growth rate is going to be skyrocketing. Whenever you lose, in a specific hard way, just understand, preferably also write it down, because writing things down is much better for your brain and your analysis results than just thinking about something. And think about what, why did you lose? And no superficial analysis like, oh, enemies are sweat lords, teammates are monkeys, enemy had king tiger and the grazer. No, actually think about What's in detail, or maybe even new observations that you did in this game? What was exactly good that the enemies did? For example, whenever I release full games, I make sure to point out what was very good that the enemies did and what surprised me positively. 
because now I know, all right, I have, I want to do the same thing the enemies did to me, <laughs> yeah. And what specific mistakes did your team do? But this is only the first layer. Most people use this to to start venting and bitching, and then they stop now. This is not analysis. Analysis starts now because now you actually have to use your brain and think about what could you have done better. Your team done better, but especially you better with this information that you have because. Obviously, after a game, you know much more than during a game. Also, you can think much more and better about the game after the game because you don't have to think about playing anymore. And sitting down like that for 10 minutes after a game can give you a much better and stronger understanding and growth as a player than playing for like 10 to 20 hours. Because most people play on autopilot. I also play most often on autopilot because I listen to podcasts in the background but yes, if your win rate isn't very high yet, just making, just stopping and using 10 minutes to analyze is going to give you an extreme advantage. So let me know what you think about these five critical mistakes. These are literally the biggest mistakes I found. And a player who doesn't do these mistakes, I guarantee is going to become one of the absolutely best players in the world. So make sure you share this video with all of your enlisted playing nerd friends. Because then we're going to have lots of cool matches and epic battles in the future. And until next time, goodbye.